Good morning, and can I welcome everyone to the eighth meeting of the Local Go Government and Communities Committee in 2019, and remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones. Agenda item one is consideration of whether to take agenda items four and five in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you. That is agreed. Agenda item two is an evidence session on city region deals. The committee published its report on city region deals in January 2018, and since then it has agreed to keep a watching brief on the development of deals. At the last meeting, we heard from representatives from the most developed deals, the Glasgow City Region deal, and from SQW, a consultancy who are evaluating that deal. Today, we are hearing from representatives of more recent deals. Today, I welcome Nikki Bridal, Chief Executive, and Gary Dallas, Strategic Director of Place, Clack Manager Council, Carol Beattie, Chief Executive, Stirling Council, Councillor Shona Haslam, Leader of Scottish Borders Council, representing Edinburgh and South East Scotland City Region Deal, Andy Nicholl, Head of Programme Management Office, Edinburgh and South East Scotland Re City Region Deal, and Jim Valentine, a member of Management Group, Tay Cities Deal. <coughs> Yes, uh, and uh, Karen Humans, it's Executive Director, Economy and Communities Committee in North Ayrshire Council, uh, gives her apologies. <coughs> Given the size of the panel, we will move straight on to questions. Uh, the witnesses could maybe give me a, an update on the status of their deals, and I do appreciate that some of them are have only just been signed, but if you could even talk about the approach being taken by uh, the governance structures. So would anybody like to begin? I thought it was going to be a short meeting there. On you go, Councillor. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Uh, thank you, and thank you to the committee for um, having us along today to give evidence. Um, the Edinburgh City Regions deal um, is at a very positive stage of its development. Um, we've had three committees or three meetings of the joint committee to date, um, and of the 1.3 billion that has been assigned to the City Regions deal, over 652 million, so half, has been um, assigned to projects by those um, three committees. So our governance is now all in place. We have the Joint Committee, Executive Board, Regional Enterprise Council, um, and then thematic uh, boards underneath those that drive the projects forward and do the work around those projects. So some key projects have, been, have already been um, instigated and, and are starting to be delivered, including the Bay Centre um, in Edinburgh, which many of you may be aware of, uh, the Robotarium, which I think should get the prize for the best city deal name, um, the Robotarium, we like that, um, and moving on uh, to look at tra specific transport projects such as the, the Sheriff Hall Roundabout um, and other key infrastructure projects. So the Edinburgh City Regions deal is in good health. We are moving forward quickly. Um, we're assigning the money and the, the work is progressing. Yeah, that's the standard of response. We're looking for us in good health and moving forward quickly. Anybody else want to come in? Thank you. Good morning, committee. Thank you very much for inviting us this morning. Um, you probably appreciate that the Stirling and Clackmanninshire deal is a little bit of an earlier stage. Um, we have been focusing quite heavily on taking forward the governance arrangements and putting those in place. So we've established a joint committee, which has met on a few occasions now. We've been looking at establishing the, the framework for the decision making um, of the, the two councils particularly and how we involve all our partners in that. We've agreed our standing orders through the joint committee process. We've also um, we established two individual commissions, the Stirling Commission and the Clack Manager Commission, but an interesting recent development has been the fact that actually we're working so closely together we thought it made sense to, to disestablish the individual committees and create one joint commission. So um, that has been agreed now by both councils and will be implemented in the coming months. Um, we're also just now looking to um, the arrangements for taking forward some of the, we have a number of bid funds within our, our deal and looking at the governance arrangements about that through our joint committee. And at our meeting just yesterday of the joint committee, we were exploring the criteria we might use to help us work through um, a situation where you've not got specific identified projects, but where we're working in partnership to identify those. I'll probably stop there because I suspect the questions will pu pull out more of the detail as we go through. Thank you very much. Carol? That's exactly what I would have said, so <laughs> fantastic partnership. So yes, Good. we are slightly behind where some of the other city region deals are, are at this moment in time. In some respects, in particular, the governance is new, 
Um, but, it, but it has met three times now, the Joint Committee. I think in terms of outlining strategic business cases, however, we are further ahead. So that's a positive step. So I'm confident that once the deal is signed, that we'll be ready to go and deliver. Thank you very much. Jim, do you have any? Yes, uh, good morning, Committee. Uh, the city deal, the Tay City deal, was set up under the initial count leadership of the four councils. We started work in March 2015, and that was in a, on a background of a long collaborative history of working across the four councils on various things. All four councils agreed to work together. We signed, we started work on the bid in 2016. And as part of that bid process, we developed a regional economic strategy to underpin all the programmes and projects that we brought forward. We set up the new joint committee in 2017, and they have continued to meet their is private sector representation and local um, higher education and further education uh, represented on the joint committee as well. We had the deal signed off in the 22nd, on the 22nd of November 2018 and we are now working towards outline business cases along with our partners. Thank you very much. Uh, Graham, I believe you want to come in. Um, yeah, um, so a question for Councillor Hasm really. Um, uh, because I was reading this week that uh, we've got um, coming uh, coming our way is the Borderlands growth deal, um, which presumably takes in at least part of your council area. Um, is there is is there um, maybe risk is the wrong word, but could the Borderlands growth deal sort of cut across the Edinburgh and, uh, you know, and South East Scotland borders? Um, yeah, we're working um, very hard to ensure that doesn't happen. Um, so we have the Edinburgh City Regions deal, we have the Borderlands Inclusive Growth deal, and we also have the South establishment of the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency. Um, so we do have an embarrassment of riches at the moment, but we're working very hard to ensure that each of those deals um, works on a specific area. So in terms of the Edinburgh City Regions deal, the money that we're receiving is specifically for development around Tweed Bank, it's specifically for um, development around economic enterprise skills and housing um, the borderlands uh, deal um, focuses on other areas um, and the south of scotland enterprise agency is much more about um, bringing forward economic uh, opportunities so we're very aware of the fact that we have um, three horses running in this race at the, at the same time and we're making sure that we're we're not um, that they are complementary rather than uh, in conflict with each other right but we get is is there a guarantee that that won't happen? Yes. I know you say that you're working hard towards it. Yeah. But. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we are, yeah, there is a guarantee that, that that won't happen, that they will work in, in, in complement with each other. OK. Um, so another question, is that OK? It'll probably lead into what Andy might want to ask. Well, Annabelle wants to come in on a, an issue here. Do you want to come back in later and then? Fine. Yeah. Andy. OK. OK, uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. To the panel, um, looking at the the deals uh, in broad brush, um, I understand that for so for example, <coughs> in terms of funding, Stirling and Clark's, um there is a mismatch of the funding. So the Scottish government has put in fifty point one million, and the UK government has pledged forty five million. And I just wonder, do you have any intelligence that the UK government is going to step up to the plate and, and come up with the other five million pounds? Is is that an ongoing discussion with them? So the additional five million from Scottish Government was specifically for Stirling projects, for two particular Stirling projects, which are being handled out with the deal itself. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the business cases and that train is in motion and to, to spend that money next year. So that's already underway. But certainly from the UK Government perspective, I haven't heard that there's any intention to match that additional £5 million. Pounds OK, and are there any discussions ongoing with the UK government to seek to extract from them? Not at this point. Amount? Not no. at this time. Um, and what about, so for Tay Cities, uh, good morning, Jim. Um, I understand that the mismatch is about £50 million, pounds, so the Scottish government has committed £200 million and the UK government £150 million. Is there any <laughs> ongoing work to seek to extract from the UK government the extra £50 million? I think um, that... What well, the terms of the deal are that it's 150 million from each of the governments to the TCE deal. The additional 50 million is being governed through governed through the deal 
but it is aligned to and does not form part of the deal. And that's the formal wording that was in the letter of offer from the Scottish Government. Right. So it's aligned to, but not governed by... OK, but, I mean, presumably another £50 million from the UK Government would be welcome. I mean, are there, are there any ongoing discussions with the UK Government to that effect no, on the part are. of the, those involved in the Taste Cities deal? There are no uh, Taste City deal discussions with UK Government around additional funding. OK. Looking also then, secondly, if I may, I can read uh, briefly at the issue of, of um, how it's working, the relations you know, between yourselves and the respective governments in terms of communication... Um, you know, who, who, is there a clear line as to who should be in control and who's seeking to be in control of spending decisions? Um, you know, are, are you having access when you want to meetings with respective officials of Scottish Government, UK Government? Uh, perhaps Sterling and Clarks could kick that off. We have regular four weekly catch up meetings with both UK and Scottish Government. So all of that is in place for the period up to the signing of the deal at this stage. So that is the Stirling and Clip Manager focus. So that will take us up to around end of May, June time, at which point we hope to have absolutely clarified the pathway to accessing the money and also the spread over the 10 to 15 years of the deal itself. So that, that's our immediate focus at this stage. OK, and so you feel that it's all fine and there's no issues at all about communication, uh, any... Uh, attempted encroachment on, on decisions that you may feel slightly uncomfortable with. Nikki, would you like to...? Um, I, I think we've pr perhaps had a slightly different experience around the um, UK Westminster Fund for Clack Manager, um, where there has been uh, probably a little bit of confusion has arisen because um, the, the Clack Manager Commission that I addressed, I mentioned in, the, in my opening statement, had gone through um, a bid process to secure bids to identify the projects that would go forward as part of that, um, taking forward that, that fund. Um, the expectation was that the um, Commission would be able to give its feedback alongside the UK Government's feedback. Unfortunately, so far, we've not been able to get the feedback from UK Government. I think part of this is a function of the incredibly tight timescales. So um, we went through the bid process in January with the Clamp Manager Commission and we were anticipating feedback by mid-February from the UK Government because what we don't want to do is give a... a um, the wrong steer really to the bidders you know we don't want to suggest that a project might be successful and then them incur extra expense and work and so on if the projects aren't then then going to be taken forward um so that has been an issue for us um and it continues to be an issue actually as i sit here today and we're still in dialogue trying to work out the next steps to align the role of the clap manager commission and getting the feedback and aligning the uk government feedback the uk government <coughs> have they given any indication as to the date by which they will give this important feedback? The date has passed. Uh, the, so passed. It was, the date that I was given was um, the 18th of February. And they haven't come back to you to give you another date? No. Well, that's our, very our, our sorry, our local MP has actually been seeking to follow that up um, and was in touch with me just last week mm. asking if I'd received feedback yet and I understand that he was also going to, to put mm. pressure on it as is our council leader and officials mm. from the council. Okay. And could I ask uh, Councillor... Uh, Haslam, how's it going with your deal on these important issues of communication and so forth? Um, yeah, we haven't had any issues at all with um, communicating with our UK government or the Scottish government. It's been a relatively smooth process. Um, when we signed our heads of terms, we had both the Prime Minister and the First Minister um, in attendance signing those heads of terms. And I think that was it, it displays the importance of the deal to both governments. Um, and both governments have been united in supporting this deal. In terms of um, funding, I think it's important to to point out that um, when we develop city regions deal, we're given very clear steer on what we can ask the UK government for and what we can ask the Scottish government for. Um, and uh, councils and, and the joint committees have, become, have come really good at ensuring that we're asking the right government for the right type of funding. Um, and so some deals will get more from the Westminster government, some deals will get more from the Scottish government, depending on um, what we are asking for and the focus of what we are asking for. Um, so I think that that has to be held in tandem with the, with the, with the 
necessity to have match funding, but realising that there's a bit of pragmatism in there in terms of how these projects are funding. But certainly from the Edinburgh City Regions deal perspective, uh, we haven't experienced any of that tension and the governments have worked very well together um, at the highest levels of government. It's encouraging. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, a moment ago that some, uh, so the matching of funds may not always be uh, symmetric. It, it, what would be examples of circumstances in Scotland where the UK government has provided more money than the Scottish government? We'll be looking at, um, in terms of, um, I can talk from the borderlands perspective, but <coughs> we do want to talk yeah. about the Edinburgh City Region yeah, deal. Yeah, probably the, the data-driven innovation um, side of the Edinburgh City Region deal. That's where the majority of the UK government money has gone. You know, different projects within it. You know, so the the grade separation of the Sheriff Hall roundabout. That's one that's you know that's a devolved matter. So that's the Scottish government are putting money towards that. So, um, so it is really the, the data-driven innovation for our deal. Um, where the UK government money has gone together with the, the impact concert hall. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess we can check with Spice if there's any example in Scotland of a deal where the UK government has given more money, but I mean, that's something we can oh. pursue oh. ourselves with yes, officials. Because I'm conscious that I, I see that other yeah. people are wanting to come in for supplementaries, but if you yeah. had any. I, sorry, no, over, overall, you know, it's, it's the same money going into to the entirety of the deal, but it's just within the individual projects, some of the money is apportioned differently. So. Hey, I'm, I'm going to let Kenny and others in, but Graham says he's got some information here on that last point that Annabelle raised. Yeah, so. um, yeah, yeah. <coughs> we, we, we obviously we've, we've covered this issue before and we uh, produced a report um, on it um, and we covered the, the kind of area of, uh, that Annabelle Ewing has been asking about, um, which was uh, what each government is, is allowed to spend. And one area of concern for the committee was that we, we felt as a committee that that was too rigid on, on both government sides, um, that really it should just be a, a, a pot of money that you can spend on useful projects. Um, <coughs> so from Annabel Ewing's point of view, she, she should maybe speak to us afterwards, uh, look back at the, the report we published, but it, we certainly covered that issue because it was a concern. Okay, well, it was just really to see if there had been any movement, and it was interesting to hear from the, the, those in the front line this morning what the current position is, and that's what I was seeking to establish. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yes, then Alexander. Really, I mean, I mean, I mean, basically... Uh, we had evidence from Glasgow on its city region deal, and uh, basically they get money from the UK and Scottish governments, and they're allowed to spend it as they think will, uh, would optimise the benefits for their deal area. But since then there's been this separation of funding into reserved and devolved areas. And I look at my own constituency uh, and my, my own area, how that's, how that's done, and it does seem kind of artificial. Do you not believe, as a panel, that the resources could be much more optimally spent if that barrier was removed and you all had the same uh, flexibility that Glasgow has in its deal to spend these resources? Can I take that? So at the outset, when we started to look, I think it was in around 2016, at Stirling Clip Manager, and at that point probably only Stirling City Deal, the emphasis was on transformational economic change. And that was a challenge that was put to us. And I think that that is what we started to come up with as we started to negotiate the deal over the, the subsequent months and years, it became much more about what the shape of the ultimate deal would look like in terms of parity between Scottish and UK government, making sure that per head of the population, mm. Stirling and Clap Manager wasn't getting more out of it than, than, for example, Glasgow or Aberdeen or the other city region deals. And that has given us a challenge because it hasn't focused on what is going to give the public the best bang for their buck in terms of economic transformation. It's about really reducing the politics, in my opinion. Yeah, that, that's my point. Anybody else get any comment? You all seem to be taking a fifth on that, apart from Carol. Um, I think we are where we are on this, and I think, you know, we have reserved matters and we have devolved matters, and, um, and that's how the governments are looking at this. So in terms of the front line, um, we'll, we'll, deal the, we'll, deal, we'll play the hand that we're given. And um, that's probably more of a question for those higher up levels of government than, than us who are delivering the deals on the ground and actually trying to deliver the projects. 
Uh, another thing, um, um, Cal just talked about there uh, about you know making sure that uh, each area gets the same per capita. Well, each area doesn't have the same issues or problems per capita. Obviously, I mean, for example, GVA in Edinburgh is forty-four thousand a year. North Ayrshire, where I represent, is thirteen thousand a year. So the needs are greater. But I notice in the borders, um, you know, eighty-five million pounds appears to have been announced this morning by the Scottish government. I'm surprised by that because usually they wait until the UK government. Uh, announces first. That seemed to be the reason for uh, not the Scottish Government not announcing uh, resources for Ayrshire prior to this. So I'd be interested in whether that has been the case, whether money has been announced. And But if that's £85 million on top of the money that the Borders is getting from Edinburgh, does that not mean that uh, the Borders is getting significantly more than uh, other parts of Scotland? You did say, and I quote earlier on, that you have an embarrassment of riches. Um. The, as I understand it, the UK government announcement is being made later today in terms of the, the Borderlands growth deal. The Borderlands growth deal covers five local authorities and many of the projects are cross-border. Um, so the £85 million announced by the Scottish government is not just for the borders, it's also for Dumfries and Galloway. Um, and our, we're looking at very much about how we can avoid the economic displacement that has been of concern in, in other deals um, and ensure that, that is, uh, our, our borders are porous in terms of how we um, benefit neighbouring areas. Um, so the 85 million is not just for the borders, it will be spread throughout the whole borderlands deal in Scotland. Um, and uh, and it's uh, the Edinburgh City Regions deal, um, our borders share of that money is 15 million. Um, we're, so, the, uh, so we're not receiving a huge amount of money from the Edinburgh City Regions deal. And I appreciate it's cross-border, because I understand it also includes uh, Carlisle City Council, Cumbria yes. County Council and Northumberland County Council. So if the UK government matches what the Scottish government has put in, then surely that would mean there'd be a significant amount, a disproportionate amount of money from the Scottish government would go north of the border, obviously, because you're only talking about Dumfries and Galloway and borders. And, and uh, how come you only ended up with £15 million out of a billion-plus deal for Edinburgh uh, borders, uh, you know, kind of deal? I mean, that's, that seems pretty dire, really, does it not? So the £15 million was for a specific project, and it's what we asked for. Um, so we were involved in the Edinburgh City Regions deal because uh, of the border railway um, coming down to Tweed Bank. Um, and uh, we basically, the 15 million was because that's what we asked for 15 million pounds. Um, in terms of the uh, borderlands growth deal, um, I think we need to wait for the, Scot for the UK government announcement before we can um, make any comments on exactly what the, what the impact of that will be. Uh, sorry, I just want to, I'm just intrigued why you asked for such a, a, a small amount relative to the size of the deal and given the geographic area of the borders. I mean, that seems to be quite a, quite a, a, a poor ask, I mean, to be honest. I mean, are, are there no issues, uh, infrastructure issues that need um, invested in in the borders? Yeah. <laughs> decision for the council to make and you got 100% of what you asked for. <laughs> well, then you are, it's not too bad. Alexander? Can I, can I just take a supplementary on what we were discussing from Annabel's comments, especially with <coughs> Southern and Clacks? I am concerned that we still have seemed to be a tension uh, between the UK government and the, the Stirling and Clax deal. Uh, that, that does give me cause for concern. And I, the perception going back when this deal started uh, was that maybe Stirling were more advanced in some parts of the process. Uh, that may not be the reality, but that was very much the perception. Uh, uh, and uh, Clack Manning have come together now and you're bringing that joint committee together and I think that's very useful to do that because you can learn from that experience together. Uh, but in reality, do is that perception correct uh, that Cl Clack Manning are slightly behind or slightly adrift from some parts of the process in the deal? Because that, that was how it was perceived and they say that may just be perception rather than reality. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I would suggest not. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I feel we're, we're working extremely well in partnership with Sterling. I, I would suggest that the comment that I made in my opening statement about the fact that we've decided to go for a single commission now is bears testament to that, actually, because that's both political and managerial will to do that from the council's perspectives. Carol outlined before when she spoke about the um, engagement we have with both Scottish government and UK government officials. That's working very smoothly. I think the... the if the and I wouldn't even describe as tension a, a point uh, of um, ongoing um, 
consideration is how we look at the UK fund. You have to remember from Clark Manager's point of view, that fund is was a unique proposition at the point in our deal. So we've had to work quite closely with UK government officials to look at the protocols and the governance that is required around that. So there's an element of, of learning from other deals as we go, making sure that we're, we're getting the right, um, we're hitting the target actually in terms of the ask for the projects that come forward. And, you know, you're, you're very confident that everything will be achieved. Uh, in, in what well, you've set out your terms and conditions, you've set out your, your path you want to achieve. So you, it's making sure you get the result at the end of the day. Yes. Uh, having everything in, in, in theory is great, but it's the practical and having things on the ground that will actually benefit the community is what we all want to see. Uh, and that's what's so important. And, and that is a, is a widely held view across the whole deal and the whole region, um, a, across all the political groups, across the businesses between both Sterling and Clax. There's no issue with that at all. Um, the, the, the other thing that I would mention is that um, one of the other things that has the potential to take us into more difficult territory would be that as a function of our deal, we have a number of bid funds. Um, but that is something that we ha are, are really putting great efforts in to make sure that that doesn't become an issue. So we're trying to work very closely to make sure that we're actually agreeing how we'll approach that. So um, actually just tomorrow morning, we've got um, a number of conversations that involve um, partners from both Stirling and Clax Council to look at how we um, take forward particularly the uh, cult Culture, Heritage and Tourism Fund, which is one of the, the shared funds, and look at how we take that forward in partnership and develop a regional narrative around that. So we're, we're working very hard on that. With regards to coming to the table um, later, I was just uh, speaking to other members of the panel before we came in and saying it's been quite interesting for us because, yes, we did come to the table later. You can't dispute the facts of that. But actually, it's been quite interesting because we're seeing a lot of opportunities to join things up because there are a lot more things that are established. So it's allowing us, when we're looking at potential projects from a CLACS perspective to see the connections really quickly. So actually what might be perceived as being um, a negative is, is more and more becoming a positive. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Um, Andy? Yeah, thanks. <coughs> thanks very much, Convener. Um, you've talked quite a bit about reserved and devolved funding, particularly from the Clickman and Stirling and Edinburgh and South East. I mean, are there any other issues with that? Because it was a topic we um, was drawn to our attention when we did our initial inquiries. Anything else that people perhaps from two cities want to talk about that? Or can we assume that that's all relatively smooth? It's, it's relatively smooth in terms of the outcomes that we have got. I think um, there is the potential, though, that if, it's, if the economic strategy hadn't been developed, and everybody from both governments and local authorities weren't tying up to the same outcomes, I think there could have been an issue because everybody had aware and an awareness of the space that they were working in right from the beginning. But I agree with, Kat, uh, with Nikki about the programmes because we are in a similar position where we have had projects that have now been lumped by the two governments into programmes and that's where the debate's going to be over the next while in, as how these programmes service the projects that people may be expected that they're not going to get in their entirety. OK, thanks. That's, that's very helpful. Um, <clears throat> Councillor Haslam, you said in your opening remarks you mentioned the Bayes Centre project in Edinburgh. Um, that was officially opened, as I understand, on the 26th of October last year, but the City Region deal was just signed three months before. How, how did that ever become part of the City Region deal? I'm going to ask Andy to answer that one. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, I think there are certain projects within the city region deal that partners would have been minded to take forward anyway without having a city region deal. What the city region deal has done is given us the, the, the ability to scale these things up and to accelerate some of these. And the base centre um, is sort of going to be sort of the hub, the focal point of the of the world class data infrastructure um, side of things and with the, the data driven innovation being such an important component part of the, the city region deal. Um, and I suppose as well, 
maybe touching it, it does sort of reflect a little bit on your reserve devolved question. Obviously, things have moved on and we've had to make sure that the, that the, the deals align with, with emerging policies, so the UK industrial strategy, the enterprise and skills review from the Scottish Government. Um, but everything within our city deal largely came when, when the universities um, came to the table to, to become a potential partner, it was fuelled by a science and innovation audit, and then that informed um, the, the selection of the projects ultimately within the, the Edinburgh City Region deal, or Edinburgh South East Scotland City Region deal. But I still don't understand if the <coughs> City Region deal was signed in August 2018 and the centre was opened three months later, how can it have been part of the deal? You don't design and commission a building in three months. No, that, that, that's true. Um, the, it, was, it was referenced in the heads of terms back in, in November 2017. Um, it was within the, the deal document that was signed in, in August 2018. Those were progressed in, in discussion and for long discussion prior to the heads of terms mm -hmm. with, with UK government and Scottish government, and they were, they were comfortable with the component parts of the deal. OK, thanks. <coughs> OK, thank you. Uh, Graham, you wanted to come in on Edinburgh and then Alex, a number of questions. Yeah, um, I've got so I'm completely baffled by that answer. I've got, I've got to be honest, um, you know, if something's built and up and running three months after the deal's signed, it's not part of the deal. The no amount of waffle can get around that. Um, but my question was, um, uh, have, have we... in? In, in the Edinburgh deal, are there any other projects that are up and running? Any started? Andy, to answer that again. Um, no, we, the, there's a lot of work going on on the skills programme as, as well that we're, that, we're, that we're progressing. That's probably one of the elements. Um, the, the impact concert hall, as I say, um, that is, there's progress being made with that. That's before our planning committee um, next, or Edinburgh City of Edinburgh Council's planning committee, um, I think on the 26th of, of April. Um, so there's there's progress being made with that. Obviously, I mean, other projects are beginning to move. Um, the you know the great separation of the Sheriff Hall roundabout. You know there will be orders laid at the end of this year in in relation to that. So you know so there is there is work ongoing, but um, you know the, the base centre is certainly the most advanced of those. What's the time scale for the Sheriff Hall roundabout? Um, well, the, as I say, the orders will be laid um, at the, the end of this year, and you know it will, it will then depend on the, the level of, of public comments, uh, potential objections to that. Um, Transport Scotland are leading on that element, but we'll, we'll be clearer after, after that. So can I, the, the, can I ask you all then, following on from that, a general question, and this leads on from our session last week where we had Glasgow. Um, one of the criticisms of Glasgow um, is that uh, there's been a very poor level of transparency around their projects. It's very hard to find out anything, actually. Um, uh, their, their website is, uh, is pretty dire. Um, how are you all um, consulting with the public, telling people uh, what you're planning, uh, involving uh, members of the public and businesses um, in, in, in your deals? And, uh, and how are you letting people know uh, what's, going, what's actually going on? in a way that's better than Glasgow. So the, the beginning of the Stirling and Clipmanninshire city region deal started with the people. So it didn't start with a group of projects that we wanted to bring forward to consult on. It started with businesses, with the communities to say, if we look at the Stirling and Clipmanninshire region into the next 15 years, what are the things that are either going to make it a success or fall off a cliff in terms of its economic success? So that was a big open question. So we had lots of feedback in terms of culture, heritage, the fact that the region doesn't have particularly strong industry sectors the way that Falkirk or neighbours do, or Edinburgh or Glasgow. So it was, what can we do that's authentic and real to our region that will make a difference? So that was the start. And all the way along, there's been the city commission, there's been public engagement, there's been a public booklet, website, etc., created. So for me, it's been a participative process from the outset, as opposed to starting with a group of projects to consult upon. Just jump in there, because that's really interesting. So some of the projects have been ideas from the people of your area. <coughs> right, OK. I just want to supplement what, what Carol had offered. So if, if I draw an alignment with what we, we've been doing in Clackmannanshire around 
a specific um, fund just now. So we invited bids. So around that went quite a lot of publicity in terms of giving a steer about what the requirements, what and um, what the, the sort of projects would be that might be looked on favourably. Uh, quite a lot of support into that process. But actually, it was it was a fantastic um, opportunity for for local people to showcase their ideas. And the commission were absolutely unanimous in the fact that they'd had quite a discussion about whether or not they would um, take presentations from all of the bidders. And they, they settled on doing that. And actually, they really um, were very pleased that they had taken presentations from everyone because it brought forward um, in, in a much better way th those ideas. And you could, it allowed us to see the potential between projects too, where we could maybe help bidders join up ideas that would make a better st and stronger strategic case that we could then support to go forward. So I think there's, there's the more strategic level that Carol outlined, but there excuse me, um, at a more um, operational level, as we're looking at individual projects and bids, there's quite a lot of opportunity there for people to get involved too. Okay. Um, the rest of you? Hey, in <coughs> in T-Cities, we've had engagement events going back to 2016 with stakeholder events across the area, dealing with the themes that were likely to be in, included in the city deal. So all that came through. Um, we're also, the chief executive of DC Thompson is on the City's joint committee, so we've been quite good at having publicity around the project and around the, the programmes as they've been developed, and we've continued that dialogue with business through further education, etc. We've also had a, a selection of community events, so we've went out to the various city development boards and other stakeholder groups as the deal has progressed. Just picking up on what was said earlier um, in terms of projects that have started on the ground that were in the city deal. Um, at least one of the councils in the Tay Cities area agreed their city deal projects back in 2016 and assumed a level of funding. And in many cases, those projects have been developing at risk to the authority, with the authorities knowing that they would have to revisit their capital programmes if required. Can I ask Andy, is that the kind of thinking that was going on with the Bayes project then? Um, yeah, so the, so the university were, you know, were, were doing that and, they, you know, similar to what Jim says there, they, they would have... Had and if anything had happened, then you'd yeah. have taken the hit? Yeah, right. that's right. Okay, okay. Uh, I just, uh, but putting public record here, I think that uh, Graham's opinion of Glasgow's uh, communication strategy was Graham's opinion of it and uh, Susan Aiken, the leader, spent quite a lot of time last week clarifying the fact that they've done some work to make it better. I just don't want it to look like there was nothing no, said or done about it. No view. Right. OK. Uh, now, Andy. Uh, Alex, sorry. <laughs> Can I maybe just follow on for that? Because whilst, whilst the Stirling Clapman and Shire deal and, and Tayside deals talked about the level of involvement in local communities and business, what was the level of consultation in terms of the Edinburgh South East Scotland deal? Um, the, I, I can start and Andy yeah. can yeah, maybe sure. pitch in anything yeah. I forget. So um, a list of projects um, were put forward by the local partners and they really came out of the local development plans that were um, built up from the councils involved. So those have an element of community participation already as councils consult a lot with the public in terms of developing those local um, local development plans. Um, we also uh, have on the boards, um, the accountability boards of uh, the Edinburgh region deal a wide variety of partners, um, including a lot of community groups who um, can, can get involved in the operation and the management of the projects as well. Um, so I think the, we also, in terms of transparency, um, we have regular reporting that are all available online. We have a dedicated website for Edinburgh City Regions deal, and all of the meetings of the Joint Committee are webcast as well, should anyone want to actually watch the, the function of the Joint Committee as well. Yeah, and there were um, two thematic, or two series of thematic workshops were held back in 2016, and I think... Um, our council leader, uh, Councillor McVeigh, when he and our chief executive, Andrew Kerr, gave evidence, they did confirm the last time that those workshops those were before my time, but they did involve the local communities as well. Um, you know, chambers of Commerce were involved in those as well. So, you know, so that started back in sort of 2016. Yeah. Well, 
Another convener, if we can ask um, each of the, the witnesses, each of the partnerships, if, if, if they can, perhaps submit some detail of the level of consultations that have taken place both with communities and businesses. That would be good. Um, because I know that in Fife there was an outcry when the city deal was announced and the leave mouth rail link was not included in that. And initially the council were attacked for, for not putting it forward. The chief executive of Fife Council then responded to say that they had been advised by the Scottish Government uh, civil servants not to put it forward because it wouldn't get through. And that raises the question, who's making these decisions at the end of the day of what's approved and not approved? I mean, what's your view on that? I suppose, you know, leaving mouth, I know that um, the co-council leader of, of Fife was here before you the last time that, you know, Edinburgh, South East Scotland, City Region deal gave, gave evidence to you, and I think he covered that there. In terms of who's taking the decisions, each of the, the, the component parts, so for us, the six local authorities um, have all had to sign off the deal document, as has the higher and, edu further, higher and further education sector through their university courts, and, and then it's been signed off with with UK government and Scottish government. But who actually, I mean, there's a document that's produced, who actually makes the decisions on what's in that document for each of the partners to sign off? That's, I mean, it's, it's between, <coughs> well, for us, what we've had prior to our, our joint committee being established is that our, you know, our six chief executives and a representative of the HEFE sector have met, and similarly our political leaders met um, and, and continued to meet monthly as they were you know, discussing and that distilled things down um, and the negotiations were happening with the UK and Scottish Government. So, um, so it's at the most senior um, ends of, the, of those organisations. So take, for example, the Sheriff Hall Roundabout. <clears throat> Anybody that drives that regularly, as I do, uh, knows that that was, that was um, a real problem, is a real problem. And there is a, there is a concern that that type of project, which the funding was already in Transport Scotland for, is suddenly being, they've happened anyway, and is suddenly being put in as part of a city regional deal that, that looks bigger than, than it was, because these things would have had to happen anyway, and the funding was available for them. What's your view on that? Yeah. yeah. That's that's undoubtedly true. At the end of the day, you know, it was it was worked out to this is a deal. You know, this this is what a deal could look like, and it's then up for the for the individual members of that. Do they want to to take that deal? And as I say, they, you know, that then went round each of the the six local councils. They considered it. You know, um, signed that off, so they were happy with that. And UK government and Scottish government were. So you know, so there are you know, if I dare say, if you were to ask each of the you know the partners involved. We were going to put 1.3 billion pounds into into your area. Are these, you know, what you would, you know, top of your wish list? All of them, you know, that 1.3. No, I don't think that's that would be the case. I think, you know, each folk would have um, different priorities. But overall, it come came back to this is the deal, you know, that, that makes all of the, you know, the, the UK government, Scottish government, and the uh, the regional partners. Are you happy to, to accept that? And, and each of those component parts, you know, approved it. Before we move off that, then, can I, can I maybe raise there, it's quite, quite interesting, given, given we do have a housing crisis in Scotland. Could you say a bit more about the housing infrastructure funding? Uh, because you say that, that or hear the, the evidence is that there's going to be a new housing company established, a creation of a new housing company uh, could you maybe exp explain a bit more about what that housing company's role is? And then in terms of the money, there was the 65 million that came in from government, and then there's partner contributions of 248 million. Again, is that 248 million coming out of uh, council housing budgets that was there for housing anyway, or how is that? Is it new money? Um, I th I th you know, I, I need to, to caveat the start. I don't know all of the, the housing funding side of things. Um, I think the important point for for the regional partners is that the 
um, the, seven, the commitment to the seven strategic sites, which was explicitly referenced within the document, um, will deliver 41,000 um, new homes in the area, um, which, is, which is much needed. Um, the precise funding of the, of, the, of the seven strategic sites may well go beyond what is, is here as part of the city region deal um, or, or, or the sums that, that we've been speaking about. But that is the express commitment within our signed deal document is to deliver on all of those seven strategic sites. You perhaps therefore send us some more detail on the housing. Because the question, the question is the, the additional 240 million, is that money that was already sitting there for housing? So is it new money or, or is it not the 65 million that, that comes in, I assume, is new money? In terms of the number of houses going to be built, would those houses have been built anyway? Well, if, if Andy's going to send us the information and says he doesn't have the figures to hand, then... If we could get that information, that would be yeah. useful. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to draw perhaps a, a contrast with our deal, because if you look at our submission, there's a summary there of the projects that are included in our deal, and you can see that there's significant additionality in the, by the nature of the projects that are included in the Stirling Clap Manager deal. I also wanted to just reflect a little on the, um, the theme that was being pursued round and about how projects come forward, because... Um, Part of, our, of the experience we did have in inviting bids is that actually you get quite a lot of an ask for revenue type projects. And of course, obviously, the vast bulk of the, the investment is capital. And it, it means that it's, it's actually quite a lot of work sometimes to work with local groups to help them realise the actual capital investment ambitions rather than things that are perhaps lower, lower more operational type matters that, that would require revenue funding. So the, there needs to be a balance when you're looking at um, what, what the projects are that are actually selected, because obviously they need to meet the criteria for funding as well. I do understand that, but the question of what's, what's actually added value, what is, I mean, is there an emphasis on gross added value as there is in the Glasgow project, is a question that, that, that I was going to come on to. But the question is that, that once we know what consultations have taken place, we also need to know would this have happened anyway. I, I'm very supportive of the, of the housing, but I don't understand why you need a housing company and and how much it would have happened anyway. And it's right, if we're going to scrutinise these deals properly, it's right and proper that we get the information in order to allow us to do so. That's the only point that I would be making. Uh, could, I, could I continue with, 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 with this and then ask, what work has been done on maximising inclusive growth within the deals? So we did an inclusive growth framework um, to make sure that across the whole programme for Stirling and Clap Manager that it was absolutely identifiable what the impacts were going to be from an inclusive perspective. So there's a skills programme matched to each of the new industry sectors. Um, there's linkages with Fort Valley College, Stirling University, uh, where we have significant areas of deprivation. There's particular projects that reach out to that. So I think probably we were the first city region deal which was, necessity, which was asked by necessity to provide an inclusive growth framework that had measurables within it to make sure that um, that is something that, that, that is going to be signed off at the stage of the deal, as opposed to coming retrospectively. Um, similar to um, the Stirling and Clax deal, we also had to put together an inclusive growth um, framework um, we've also, as well as doing that, we've also introduced um, consistent community benefit clauses into all of our um, business cases. Um, and the, the PMO has drafted a paper showing um, how the region's community benefits model um, will, 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 all of our projects will be scored against that model. Um, so the ones that agreed that strand of work is going to be incorporated into the integrated um, employer engagement proposition um, within our skills programme. Um, and this will come before the Joint Committee in 2019. Um, our Vice Chair of the Regional Enterprise um, uh, Executive Committee um, is also uh, uh, Claire Petullo, who has a strong interest in social enterprise and community engagement. Um, so community benefit is of, of key concern to all of our projects moving forward, and we have to measure what that community benefit is. 
Yeah. I think in terms of the Taste City deal, all our initial projects were scored on, on GVA uplift. But then when we started to look at it in a bit more detail, we started to consider things like rurality. How do we upskill? Because we don't have a really low unemployment rate, except in some pockets in Taste Cities. But how do we lift those wage levels? So there are programmes linked to all the projects in terms of, of employability, etc. Um, also, a big issue was connectivity. How do we get people to work? So we've looked at that in terms of inclusiveness. How do we put a programme in place where people maybe pay a bit less or can get to, to centres of employment a bit quicker? Okay. And in terms of the objectives and outcomes, are they measurable objectives and outcomes? And as is there progress monitoring systems being put in place from the outset of, of these projects? Yes, for them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cut start one. Um, so, what about the review process for each deal? Um, so, Glasgow, we heard last week. Uh, there's a process being applied to RSQW. Uh, are, 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 there's, a, there's an ongoing review process in place. Is there, is there anything with other deals? reach that point. So we've not actually signed the deal yet, so we anticipate that will be something that we'll discuss during the course of yeah. finalising the deal. As, yeah. as regards our review, we've, um, we're early in the process, but what we've already realised is that the economic strategy that we agreed back in 2016-2017 is needing refreshed. So we're going to refresh that and then look at the outcomes against the new regional economic strategy. But you will be putting something in place? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. I, th I think within the grant offer letter that we got from, you know, on, on, from Scottish government, but on, on behalf of both both governments, that sets out a series of requirements of of the the, the monitoring, the reporting, the evaluation that we have to do, which builds towards for us. Well, there will be an annual conversation for us that be, uh, we'll have our first of those in the autumn. Um, so, yeah. finally, can I ask? Clubmanager's council is well documented in terms of the financial uh, crisis that, that it's been going through, but it's a question, I think, for, for each one in terms of the capacity within those councils, given the financial constraints, the capacity around planning, economic development. A lot of those services are the ones that, that were, if you like, the easier cuts to make politically, and, and a lot of these services have been cut back. Does that create any difficulty in terms of delivering uh, these kinds of projects? I would suggest, um, so far, what we've been doing, we're having to reinvest. So we're finding that where we have reduced capacity, I'm now looking at, uh, we, we've got various steps in place to augment the, the project management office in Clax to support the city region deal. But what's happened in the intervening period is in working with our partners, we've agreed and shared the tasks between us. So not just between the councils, but also we've got a very good relationship with Stirling University and the, the project management office has worked very well between the three of us. So I think knowing that our project management office should be there throughout the turn of the new financial year, we've managed to get through all the processes to date but you are right there was there was a general issue about the need to refocus and reprioritize to make sure that we had the capacity to take forward city deal yeah, um, i agree with that i think that um councils are under a huge pressure um and we are always looking at how we are going to be making savings while protecting frontline services um certainly the pmo pmo office has been a massive benefit to that um, and having having that in place and having the support of that group has been very helpful. Um, it is a challenge, um, but it is one that councils will will rise to and will deliver on the deal commitments. <clears throat> I'd probably supplement that in terms of our, our sort of governance structure. As you'll see within that, underneath our executive board, we've got a directors group, which tends to be the strategic directors that cover the areas. I mean, not all of the um, the local authorities have the same sort of different divisions and departments, but we tend to have the strategic directors that have responsibility for housing, transport, economic development, 
land use planning are the ones that, that we've been meeting with. And that collective discipline of meeting on a monthly basis, supplemented in the intermediate fortnight by the chief executives um, meeting, sort of make sure that you know that we are you know we're closely on track in monitoring. Is there going to be any sort of resourcing issues? Um, as a PMO, we've we've taken things to the directors group and to the executive board in terms of if we thought that there was any resourcing considerations. You know, we've um, we've recruited a dedicated accountant um, for for certain. Uh, well, to oversee the financial aspects in our capacity as accountable body for the deal. So, you know, so we're closely monitoring. You know, I mean, the, the points you make are, are perfectly valid, um, but we're, you know, we're alive to to that. Yeah. Um, in TCE's part of our formal offer to government was that we would work collaboratively together, and we hoped that would be reciprocated, and that they would bring some resource to the table. So that's working we've been, in some areas with some government agencies. We've been well supported by Scottish Enterprise and Skills Development Scotland. And alongside that, the uh, colleges, universities and ourselves, we're managing to resource that we've got project management office in place. But we see that as the future of working going forward and that we need to build more on that. And there are some other government agencies, I think, that need to step forward and get involved in that. Thank you. Can we, we've talked about this morning communications, and I think the communications has been vitally important. And you've outlined all of you about the communications you have at the sort of political level, at the council level, and the business level. Uh, but the communities are, 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 at the end of the day, the crux of this whole process. Uh, you know, the, the, the idea behind many of these deals was innovation, uh, was research, uh, was jobs, was skill, uh, and, and, and trying to ensure that that does become the reality. You know, for some communities, this deal is a lifeline, uh, which they've never had for decades, uh, and it will give them the opportunity to unlock the potential uh, within that community, but also unlock the potential for skills and jobs for people within these communities who have seen, uh, uh, just through their, their own environment, uh, uh, it not being the most uh, prospects uh, for, for, for young people and, and people being part of that whole process. So, so can I ask, you know, when we're looking at the risks that you face in trying to achieve some of these goals uh, uh, and, and, and negotiating that and communicating that uh, across your council areas to ensure that you do get that. Uh, what are the challenges that you still face in making that dream become a reality? Who wants to go first? No, I'll start with that. <laughs> I thought there was no challenges left then. Is it? <laughs> I don't think the challenges are community, communicating with the community. I think I outlined earlier that a lot of ours started with the community. So if I take one example, which is the river that connects Clipman and Sharon Stirling, so it's probably a reasonably good example to give. Uh, both of us as towns, cities have turned our back on the river over a number of different decades, which is unusual across Europe. So the community felt that. They felt that the river was there. Nobody noticed it. It wasn't used for anything particularly. So the bid that we had put forward was to bring the use of the river back into play again for the economic and social benefit of both of the, or right across the region. Community's been part of developing, what do they want to see in terms of a skills development programme? So it's boat building, it's heritage conservation, it's tourism, it's a whole manner of different things that, that Fort Valley College students, Stirling University, Council Community have all been involved in, in creating. So it's not just about creating a nice shiny looking thing on the banks of the River Forth. It's what does it actually mean in job terms for the local people? Just a, a very um, quick supplement to that. The location of a, a lot of the projects that have been approved within the Stirling Clarksdale on the riverbank is really important because it coincides from a clap manager point of view with some of our greatest areas of deprivation. So those communities that we want to, to benefit as much as possible from the investment that comes with City Deal. So South and East Alloa, where the location for the Scottish International Environment Centre is and associated um, other projects that maybe um, crystallise on that same site is, is a once in a generation opportunity I would suggest for our area and we really view it in those terms. Terms. So I think the location is just as important as the actual um, projects that are being taken forward. Inclusive <coughs> growth um, framework. Um, the, the kind of things that we found were was that 22% of children were born into poverty in the region. Um, 0 0.55 jobs per working age resident in East Lothian um, compared to 1.02 in Edinburgh. Um, 22% of working age residents in Midlothian have degrees for the figures 49% in Edinburgh. So how do we square that circle and how do we make sure that that um, 
that challenge of creating well-paid, skilled jobs that are accessible to not the working age population of today, but the working age population of tomorrow is a key thing. Now, one of the really innovative projects within Edinburgh City Regions deal, and one close to my heart, is the Investing in Families project. And that's something that's been um, at the forefront of with Fife Council, but it's being uh, rolled out across the city region deal area. Um, and that is engaging with families who have long-term unemployment and low aspiration, low self-esteem, low self-confidence in the children. And how do we engage with those families to raise the aspiration and raise the attainment of children who are used to worklessness? Um, it's a really interesting project. It's not what you would consider a normal city deal project. It's not building something big and shiny. It's not investing in um, a really interesting uh, you know, development or culture or that kind of thing, but it actually gets to the crux of the matter of how do we, do, how do we build uh, a good, um, skilled workforce who are equipped to take on these highly paid, well-skilled jobs in the future. And it's raising that aspiration. So it's a very interesting project with an Edinburgh City Regions deal that actually um, deals with the core problem that we're facing at the moment. I think in T-Cities there has been a problem, and I think it's maybe across the piece with some of the messaging, particularly in the rural areas, because the city deal in some areas has been presented as very much a solution for the cities and for the bigger settlements. And that's why we have focused on broadband and connectivity and how do you bring people in from the rural areas who can work in some of the centres where, if we're being honest, that's where the work's going to be in the future, that's where the decommissioning will be, that's where the, you know, the large number of jobs will be. Um, so we've been really talking to a lot of people whether that's up in Nangas Glens or whatever, how do they link it in Montrose Port and proposed developments in Montrose Port? What are the opportunities there? And what training opportunities do we need to give out with the normal catchment along the, the East Coast? And how do we connect these communities in? So I think there, there is a bit of a challenge and we're working our way through that. And I think you've, you've, you've identified uh, what you're all trying to do and, the, and there is similarities across the deals, but you have your own individual and your own tailor-made uh, uh, aspirations you want to achieve. So can I ask, has there been sort of decent dialogue between each of you about the shared learning experiences that have taken place uh, and you've learned from each other's uh, process? As I say, we, we, we've heard from Glasgow in the past about some of the difficulties they had uh, and, and have you all learned from that uh, and are continuing to learn from that? So the recently established um, PMOs, the project management uh, offices, have now got a network where they meet regularly to discuss how, how we learn from each other um, and how those kind of best, best practice models can be rolled out. <clears throat> Probably need to give Jim's colleague Mo Saunders in, the, in their PMO the, sort of, um, the credit for sort of initiating that. But I think that was on the back of, of committee having suggested that as well, and also the Audit Scotland um, review that they are doing as well. So, um, so most of the PMOs are, are on the panel, you know, supporting um, Audit Scotland in doing that. Um, one of the things that's maybe relevant as well to, to touch on the inclusive growth is that at our last joint committee, we also invited the Equalities and Human Rights Commission um, to, to come and to present to us, and we've asked them to look in, and they have looked at all of our business cases within our, you know, what we take forward, well, you know, the equalities con considerations are up front. What we've also done at the next meeting of the PMOs is that we've arranged for the Equalities and Human Rights Commission to come and to address the PMOs generally, so that we can try to do that. In a a consistent basis um, across all city region deals. Thank you, Convener. Uh, yes, just a brief supplementary in the Qualities and Human Rights Commission. Are, are there, analy are there um, analysis of your business cases published? Um, no, no, they have No, they're not. No. Would you publish them? Um, with their permission, we would, you know, they've, you know, I suppose it's. It's less been sort of providing reports, they've been sort of giving us feedback, we've had meetings, so it's not all sort of been in, in written form. They did present to our, uh, our joint committee, which is webcast and is there for, for repeated viewing, so you can see that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with what you're proposing. I'm just not sure that we've, we've got something ready-made to do that, but I'd be happy to, um, you know, to, um, to liaise with them to see if there's, if there's something that they would be happy to publish and on an ongoing basis. Um, but there's certainly the equalities considerations are in our published committee reports as well. So I, I just sort of misunderstood what you'd said then. I, I thought you were saying the Quarters Human Rights Commission had looked at each of the projects. They, they have. Um, 
but they've they've not sort of they've not provided something formal back to the joint committee. Um, you know, so what was the point in looking at them if they didn't provide anything to the committee? Um, well, they, they they provided it to to the PMO, and we fed the, that back to you know to those that were progressing the business cases. So we've incorporated things within the business cases. Um, so you know it's not a, you know, if they had a published report to go alongside the committee papers, you know then um, you know I'd be happy to, to publish that. I mean I'm happy with the with the with the spirit and the, the intent of, of what you're saying. I'm just you know I'm not sure we have something neatly to hand to. Well, to given our interest in inclusive growth, yeah. I think the committee would be interested in that. Yeah. So if yeah. you can provide that to committee, that would be helpful. I'd be yeah. particularly interested in their assessment of the Sheriff Hall roundabout. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Kenny. Aye, thanks very much. I mean, the, uh, over the course of a deal 10, 15, 20 years, the, the, the resources provided by the Scottish Government and the UK Government are flat profiled. But to get some of these projects up and running, local authorities have to front load capital spend. Now, uh, some of your authorities are, are, are relatively small. How does that impact on other capital projects, such as, for example, building a school going forward? I'm happy to start off with that, yeah. if that's OK. Um, it, that's certainly something that's been subject to much consideration for us in Clark Manager recently. Um, there's been a large amount of discussion between myself and the leader on that as we've been starting to look at financial profiling as we look towards um, signing off the full deal. Um, I, I think that, in summary, where that conversation at is it comes down to choices because where you've got a smaller council with a smaller um, capital programme, you, you have to look at is this the city deal project funding versus the, the other ambitions that you've got for the area. And um, the, the other thing that we have been discussing, though, is the extent to that which that situation can be mitigated by looking for other investment in the projects. So if we can secure um, business investment or, or, or other types of funding to support the city deal, it might be that the council doesn't have to front load all of that. Similarly, looking across some of the other partners as well, is there an opportunity there? But we're, we're pretty early stages on that, having identified the, the, the situation relatively recently as we start to look at the financial profiling, it's starting to, you're starting to get a better uh, feel for the size and shape of that, that issue. Yes, I mean, obviously from um, earlier questions, I talked about flexibility and the lack of it in, la in latter deals relative to Glasgow vis-a-vis, -vis, um, you know, UK government and Scottish government funding. But this is clearly another inflexibility. I mean, obviously, would you like the Scottish and UK governments to be much more flexible in terms of the profile of funding? Because although these projects that are going forward in terms of deal are very important for, for all the, the areas, what you don't want to do is to have to delay, for example, the construction of a school for three or five years because you're having to put all your eggs into the one basket of, of these deal projects. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, I, th I think that's a very fair assessment. And one of the things, as we're looking at our financial profile, we, we can see that there's this wee peaks and troughs. As you look at it, certainly the profile isn't coming out flat. Um, and we, we, we've just been having those conversations about particular pinch points <coughs> in some of the early years and how we might like to take that conversation back. Are there other areas in the same uh, situation as, as Clark Manager? Yeah, um, we think that the flat profile spend is a major issue. I mean, the, the local authorities can deal with it, and a lot of our local authorities have included it in their capital programme. It's an issue for the private sector because they just don't understand. They have There's an expectation for the private sector project that this funding will come along early in the process. And if that's not happening, um, I think there's going to be a lot of disappointed people. And, 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 and I know there's a lot to come in on this, but just to, just to touch on, on that, uh, 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 Jim, does that mean that it's making it more difficult to attract the, and lever in the level of private sector funding at the, uh, that you want and at the time that you need it to be levered in? Well, what I'm really talking about is the, private, the projects that are being led by the private sector. So they are, there's an expectation amongst them that they will get the money early in the process. A lot of these have their investment plans in place. So the local authorities have to step up the, yeah. to the plate on these projects, whether or not the capital funding is available specifically from yeah. the Scottish or UK governments. S sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, we're not flat funded, um, so right. our funding comes in, in uh, streams. But um, but I, I shared the view of the other councils. If it was flat funded, it would, it would cause us significant challenges and therefore greater flexibility around that would be welcome. 
Yeah. Yeah. Why you're not flat fund you you're not flat funded, but obviously that's still in that's a suggestion. But we're still in negotiation. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. So we're trying not yeah. to <laughs> right, okay. maybe say too much on that at the moment. But it, we, our expectation would be that we would face similar challenges to to the Edinburgh City Region deal, therefore, why would we not expect a similar level of flexibility for Stirling Clip Manager? Yes, and indeed in Ayrshire and Maloney area, yeah, although they're not a, a represented here today. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <coughs> Thank you for that. Could you, did you want to come in? An interesting line of questioning there. Um, so, flat funding, do you think that could actually jeopardise some projects? <laughs> It, it won't jeopardise it. Councils are very good at um, working around these things to ensure that projects are delivered. Um, it m would factor into our thinking a lot more before we put projects forward for consideration. But once the projects are in the business cases, we only put projects forward that we're confident in delivering. And if the funding model is flat funding, then that would be the consideration that we would take. And in Stirling and Clarks? I think for, from our perspective just now, I think you would come down to those very hard choices that were suggested before about yeah. local investment, so your school estate strategy, leisure facilities, etc., versus city region deal projects, because that's how tight our capital programmes are. Which is not really the idea behind these deals. Um, so just, just one, um, it's a very short question, um, and it falls on from something Alex Rowley asked about where the decisions are made. Um, within each council, do these projects go through uh, committees for, you know, for councillors to assess and vote on? that's working within the council um, so in Scottish Borders we don't have a committee system so a report comes to full council where it's discussed um, and a decision is taken. Okay. Our deal went to committee uh, as a deal but the individual projects have also all gone up in the capital programme. Are they individually looked at by, by councillors? Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Case, can I thank the panel for attending today's session? Further evidence sessions in the city region deals are to be arranged with the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity and the Secretary of State for Scotland in due course. Thank you again. Yes, yeah, so I'll suspend briefly to allow a witness changeover.
At agenda item three, the committee will take evidence from the Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning in relation to the full poverty target definition and strategy Scotland Bill. Specifically, we are discussing options for the development of a separate minimum income standard for islands and remote areas. And I welcome, once again, to the committee, Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, and Cornelius, Fuel Poverty Bill Team Leader, and Ailey Clarkson, Statistician, Statistician Scottish Government. I invite Mr Stewart to, to make an opening statement. Uh, good morning, convener. It's a uh, word I have a problem with as well, I have to say. Um, at stage one, I, I welcomed your support of our proposed use of the UK minimum income standard in the measurement of fuel poverty uh, and recognised concerns raised about the higher costs faced by those living in remote rural areas, remote small towns and island communities. Uh, therefore, I committed to bring forward uh, an amendment at stage two uh, to introduce uh, a MIS uplift for these areas. Uh, I provided the committee with the details of the three options I considered. Uh, these options were informed by expert advice from Professor Donald Hirsch. Uh, and let me provide some background to the options that I examined. First, first, all options are based on the extensive research that already goes into the UK MIS. Uh, they align with scheduled updates to the UK MIS and focus on an identifying where there are additional costs in these areas. Secondly, expert advice suggests that for this purpose, extensive primary research should be carried out periodically. Uh, an eight-year period from 2020 is proposed. Finally, the amount by which costs are higher varies more greatly by household type than ge geography. Uh, the research will be conducted across various remote rural, remote small town and island locations so that the MIS uplift is representative of all of these areas. And this will lead to an average uplift varying by three main household types, working age, pensioner and families. Uh, those points are reflected in the options that I considered. Option one uh, accounts for specific goods and services and higher prices in these areas and applies a flat threshold of 110% of UK MIS reviewed on the proposed eight-year cycle. 110% is in line with advice from Professor Hirsch. Option two only allows for higher prices but not specific goods and services. It determines new uplift thresholds uh, for the three main household types annually. Uh, option three is the most comprehensive. Uh, new uplift thresholds for the three main household types are determined annually based on assessment of both the goods and services required as well as their price. New primary research underpinning this would take place every eight years, and in intervening years, account will be taken of inflation as well as biennial collection of local price data and analysis of the impact of any changes to UK MIS. Uh, therefore, convener, uh, my pref preference would be that option three uh, provides the most balanced and comprehensive approach, uh, and I'd be happy to hear your views on these and willing to answer any questions that you may have, convener, although when it comes to some of the technicals, I may be referring to Ms Clarkson. Uh, she does that job that I struggle with the title of, doesn't she? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Graham, you have a couple of questions you want to ask? Yeah, um, thank, uh, can I, first of all, thank you, uh, Minister, for the way you've uh, engaged with the committee on, on this issue. I think it's been very positive. Um, can, can I just uh, follow up on what you said about uh, Professor Hirsch? Uh, can you tell us to what extent he has been involved in, in devising these three options? Um. Uh, Professor Hirsch uh, has been uh, very helpful. Um, Ms Clarkson and uh, her colleagues have been in touch uh, with him on uh, a, a, a number of uh, occasions around about this. Um, so he has been uh, fairly heavily uh, involved in, in terms of this. Um, our analysts um, have uh, uh, considered the evidence uh, provided by Professor Hirsch for this bill. Uh, and 
as I say, a, a, a great amount of conversations have taken place with him um, in developing these options. Uh, and we have taken his advice on board uh, in that regard. Uh, 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 and obviously, um, that's vital in terms of his knowledge uh, of the UK uh, MIS. Options uh, one and three um, are based directly on some of uh, Professor Hurst's suggestions. Uh, while option two presents an alternative, um, I would acknowledge uh, without doubt that Professor Hirsch himself would not be supportive uh, of this option since it does not require that specific basket of goods um, and services uh, to be developed uh, in remote uh, rural and island uh, communities. Um, and that's part of the reason why I've indicated that uh, my preference would be um, for option three, uh, which I think offers a, a good, uh, balanced, comprehensive and, most importantly, evidence-based approach. So if we rule out... Um, option two on the basis that you you don't like it and Professor Hirsch doesn't like it. Who who came up with the the other options one and three? Um, a combination of work between Professor Hirsch and Ms Clarkson um, a, 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 and her colleagues. Uh, I'll let Ms Clarkson give you the detail, <coughs> uh, some more detail of that work as a, as it was seen through you, convener, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, we had a number of conversations with Professor Hirsch around about this um, and talked about ways in which this recommendation of the committee could be achieved. Um, and Mr. Professor Hirsch, sorry, <laughs> uh, indicated that something like 110% uh, of the UK MES in these areas would be a suitable approach uh, for fuel poverty measurement. Um, the other option, option three, was also discussed with him, and we feel that that goes... <laughs> further, um, so it does exactly what you're looking for in terms of the committee, um, but it does it in a way that builds on research that is available, uh, <coughs> primary research every eight years, but also work in between times to make sure that the uplifts that are being applied um, are as up-to-date and relevant as possible. Okay. Uh, if, I, if I could, one of the, the notes that we have um, from uh, Professor Hirsch, um, uh, as you can imagine, there's been some pretty comprehensive uh, toing and froing in this. <laughs> but if I, if I could maybe um, read this bit. Uh, finally, um, I would end by noting that if a, a simplified percentage, uh, such as 110% of MIS, were adopted, uh, it would be important to review this from time to time, as our update in 2016 showed that these costs can be quite sensitive um, to change. So, again, that's one of the reasons why uh, I, I, my preference would be for option three rather than some of the, the, the more su simplistic alternatives. OK. Um, all MSPs have been, were, were emailed this week by Energy Action Scotland um, with a... A basket of potential amendments, um, one of which is uh, MIS, MIS uplift for people with addition, additional costs. Um, their submission to MSP says the UK MIS specifically does not take account of those individuals or groups who have additional costs, such as those who have a disability or long-term illness, um, and they're calling for an uplift to Take, take that into account. It, you, you'll, have, you'll have seen this because we're all sent it. Um, have you got any comments on that? Uh, convener, um, if the committee wishes, uh, I'm more than willing to uh, respond um, in writing around about all of the proposed amendments if the committee um, finds that useful. Um, in terms of um, that proposed amendment, which is uh, Amendment 4, I think, in, in their list, um, the provisions of the bill um, already include um, uh, uh, an enhanced heating regime for those households which may be most affected uh, by the uh, adverse outcomes of living in a colder home. And uh, as we've already discussed, we'll define those in regulations, um, uh, the households to which uh, that would apply. Um, obviously, this applies uh, higher temperatures and longer heating hours than for other households, um, which results in higher required fuel costs. Um, convener, um, I have uh, asked 
my officials to analyse uh, all of those pr proposed amendments and the impacts, um, and I'm more than willing uh, to provide m much more detail about that proposed amendment, but also the others that have been uh, uh, shared with the committee and other MSPs. I mean, that, it's entirely up to you, but you'll uh, be aware that timescales are pretty tight on this. Uh, you know, I will do my level best to try and get the information to the committee as soon as possible. I, I would say that some of those these proposed amendments, um, I, I would say, um, would be out of scope of the bill. Yeah. Um, in terms of a parliamentary committee suggestion as in one of the amendments, um, it's not for me to tie the hands of Parliament. Uh, it's up to Parliament to decide um, uh, which uh, committees it establishes. Um, be beyond that, um, you know, there are, are, are some aspects of the, these amendments um, which I think would be unachievable um, and may um, uh, actually cause some grief in terms of if you were to move too quickly in terms of not having uh, the technologies in place, you could be replacing uh, technologies uh, to deal with something and then not far along the road, uh, ripping those out and putting in uh, other technologies. I, 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 if, if it pleases the committee, I, I would rather go into much more depth in all of this um, in writing, um, if that is helpful. And we'll provide you with the evidence uh, that we have uh, around about all of this. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, convener, um, we want to, oh, I'm sure we all want to uh, do all of this from an evidence base and we'll do the very best to provide you with that. Thank you. Okay. Alexander? Can I ask about the assessment of, with reference to the, the prices in remote small towns uh, and island communities and how that is going to be conducted uh, and what primary research will be done and who will be doing the research? Um, that's quite a complex question, uh, that, uh, convener. Um, <laughs> it's um, <laughs> it's, it's uh, expected that the organisation uh, responsible uh, for the uh, r remote rural um, uplift uh, will organise uh, research panels of local households. Um, that would be across several of the, the areas um, covered, uh, the locations covered um, that we've al already um, agreed upon, and that would be split into those three uh, main household types that I've already talked about, uh, namely working age, um, pensioner households, and family households. households. Um, the way um, that this has been done previously is that through in-depth discussions, uh, they'll first of all determine uh, what additional goods and services are required by these households um, to maintain uh, an acceptable standard of living. Um, uh, that would be using the UK MIS basket of goods and services as a starting point. Um, they will then explore um, with these households um, uh, a number of other things uh, around about price information, uh, where they may be buying goods from, uh, so local stores and things like that. Um, internet purchases, which of course is a, a biggie, um, and we are all aware of uh, the work of Richard Lockhead and others in terms of delivery, so all of that would be uh, taken into account. Uh, local transport providers, um, and you know the list uh, goes, goes on. Um, price information um, on these things would be collected every two years um, and that would take into account any consequential changes as well from the updating um, of the UK MIS. Um, so pr a pretty comprehensive um, approach, I would say. And by, and by having that criteria and putting into uh, some of those locations and, and understanding how they, as you've already identified, Minister, uh, just by their very nature of where they are, uh, they have to endure uh, some of those financial pressures that others don't have the chance or, or the amenities to deal with. Uh, and I think that will give you a, a, a view uh, of where they are, uh, uh, but also then you'll be able to compare and contrast uh, 
uh, what's happening across different communities in different locations as to if, if there is similarities or there are areas that are in greater need. Convener, there will be similarities um, across the board with other um, of the elements that are used to formulate the UK MIS. Um, but this is much more comprehensive. Um, and, you know, we will um, find out, I'm quite sure, the differentials that exist um, in uh, certain things. Um, we may also find at certain points uh, that certain uh, goods and services may be cheaper um, in some of these uh, communities um, compared to the, to the UK MIS. Um, a lot of folk will say that that's highly unlikely, um, but it is possible. But we will have a comprehensive um, overview uh, using the experiences um, of households to see exactly what they face. Uh, and then from there, um, you know, we can, we can work out exactly um, what's required. Or, um, not we, uh, but Ms Clarkson and uh, uh, her fellow professionals in that profession that we won't mention, um, and uh, 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 Professor Hirsch uh, uh, or whoever else is involved will be able to, um, to, to look at that comprehensively. Thank you, Convener. Okay, thank you. Annabelle, you wanted to come in? Yes, thank you, Convener. Just, I felt it probably related to the discussion we've just had. And good morning, Minister. Um, I, I'm not sure if you have been cited on an email uh, that we received from Di Alexander, the chairman of, I have to get this on the record, HEHAW, which I've just done, which is quite good, <laughs> which, of course, is the Highlands and Islands Housing Association Affordable Warmth Group. Um, so I just, uh, the, their key uh, ask is that there be two separate uh, rural MIS, one for the islands of 115% and one for all remote rural mainland areas, 110%. And obviously, I'm sure you're currently reflecting on this and having officials look at this and so forth, but I just wonder if you'd any comment on this uh, at the moment. Um, uh, convener, uh, I have seen uh, Mr Alexander's um, email um, and uh, my officials have been... Uh, Speaking to, to Mr Alexander um, on a, a regular basis, I have to say that I haven't seen him for a while, but uh, he's, he's always uh, uh, very forthcoming with his uh, views on, on many of these issues. Um, uh, convener, um, I recognise uh, some of the arguments um, that uh, Mr Alexander has put forward, and we'll continue to... Um, uh, discuss these with him, but I think there are some difficulties in what uh, Mr Alexander proposes uh, as well. And I refer back to the um, point that I made earlier, um, quoting from uh, the communication from Professor Hirsch, um, where he, he said, and I'll repeat it again, I would end by noting that uh, if a, simp uh, a simplified percentage, such as 110% or whatever percentage it may be, of MIS were adopted, it would be important to review this from time to time, as our update in 2016 showed that these costs can be quite sensitive to change. Now, I think that what we're proposing um, in terms of the comprehensive approach across the board um, gives us, I think, uh, a situation which um, will cover all of these changes much better um, than just having um, a fixed uh, percentage um, at any um, point in time. Um, I'll maybe hand over uh, to Ms Clarkson, because uh, I know that uh, she and uh, others um, uh, have uh, talked to uh, Mr Alexander uh, very recently. Um, and beyond that, I should say to the committee that uh, I have other officials at this moment who are, uh, I think, probably in the air between Orkney and Shetland at this moment, uh, continuing to gather uh, views uh, as we progress. Ailey. I'll remember to press the speak button this time. Sorry. You don't have to. <laughs> Do I not have no. to? It does it for me. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, we have had some discussion with Mr Alexander, and um, from that discussion I understand that he is generally very supportive of option three um, in the paper, um, particularly the idea that these um, uplifts would be up updated on an annual basis and that they would be based on that extensive research that we have proposed. Um, 
However, you know, his, his feeling is that there should be some account taken of differences between the islands and other areas. Um, we have had some discussion about the figures that he um, included in uh, that communication. Um, and I have pointed out that 115% uh, is, is probably too high um, and that that would probably in the island areas actually also be closer to 110%. Um, I think in, in our view, the discussion with Professor Hirsch and others has always suggested that the biggest variations in terms of differences in uplift is by those household types. And that's what we are proposing to take account of in option three, the, the, the differences that are the biggest. Um, and I think that does more than just a single uplift in terms of 110 per cent. Um, so we're, we're, we're going further than what we could have done um, to meet the recommendation. Clarify if, if you're doing this sort of overall survey, if you're if you're taking everything into account, this basket of goods as you call it, would that, would that not then pick up on where it's most needed, be it an island or be it in a rural mainland? That would hopefully be the case, but I'll take Ms. Clarkson in again. Um, I mean, obviously, the way that this uh, research would be undertaken would be to take account of, you know, the, the differences in different areas, and we would be doing research groups with people from different parts of these organisations, uh, not geographies, um, and, and so that would uh, look at those aspects. But what Professor Hirsch has done is already look at that in relation to the existing work that existed around the Highlands and Islands uh, work from 2013 and 2016. Um, and his information suggested, as I've pointed out already, that uh, in terms of geography, that variation and uplift wasn't really so great as by household type. And that is something that he's already considered based on that um, research that was already undertaken in those different areas. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course, Annabelle. So, uh, I mean, I've listened carefully to what you've said. So as a statistician, somebody on this committee that can pronounce that word, mm -hmm. always useful. Um, it, it seems to me what is basically being said is that option three is more sophisticated and as a result would pick up what it would need to pick up, whether um, in fact on any given island the differences were such as to be material uh, as opposed to differences in terms of type of house. So if that actually were to present, this would be sophisticated enough, option three, to pick up what would need to be picked up in order to ensure uh, that it was reflecting reality in the ground, wherever that happened to be. That seems to be what you've said. I think that's the case, but uh, again, uh, I'll, I'll take in Ms Clarkson. Yeah, I mean, I think what we are proposing to do is, is suitable for the purposes of fuel poverty measurement. Um, it's looking at providing that uplift for those different household types using an average across those different areas. So it's taking account of that research in those different areas, but it is providing that as an average uplift. OK, thank you. Uh, and I, I should say, um, convener, um, that this proposal uh, is in line with uh, some of the um, uh, recommendations that came out of the panels previously. Uh, Kenny, you wanted to come in? Yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah, this issue about uh, averages, I mean, we ca it can't be over elaborate, obviously. I mean, it's, we, there's got to be some kind of common sense approach whereby we have a position that, that does look uh, at the islands as a whole, but within that, there is a huge differential in terms of the type of houses and type of the, uh, the, 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 the cost of fuel provision and also the cost of living. I mean, it's quite significant. I mean, even in the Clyde Islands, there's a difference between Butte, Cumbria and Arran, for example. So sh I would imagine that there'll be a bigger difference between some of the islands and the mainland than there might be even within each other. So I'm just wondering how that... I, I, I mean, even how do you work out an average as well if you're looking at different populations? So, for example, you've got islands like, you know... Um, Collins say with maybe only 150 people, how can you average them out with, for example, Shetland with over 20,000? I'm just concerned about how you would, um, you know, although you can't be absolutely specific to every single island, clearly, I'm just wondering what allowances will be made for communities that will have specific issues in terms of uh, of uh, the cost of living on these islands and, and, the, and therefore the relative cost of, of fuel and everything else? Convener, um, Mr Gibson is <laughs> exactly right in terms of um, the differences that uh, exist um, uh, across uh, the board uh, around about all of this. Um, what we uh, do not want, I'm sure, uh, is a situation where it is overly complex 
um, in trying to get to a point which may not be that different. Um, uh, and uh, I think that what we have here um, is the right balance in terms of uh, getting uh, this right for everyone um, in remote, uh, rural and island areas, whether they live in uh, Arran or whether they live um, uh, in uh, Ricey. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, there are some folk who, I, I, who are out there who uh, would add to the complexity so much um, that, you know, you'd probably be as well trying to do in every individual house, which would be absolutely unachievable and be uh, a complete and utter bureaucratic nightmare. Uh, and we've got to balance this out. I think that what um, is proposed here um, after discussion uh, with Professor, Professor Hirsch strikes that, that, that balance. Um, I'm going to bring in uh, Ms Clarkson, who obviously um, has looked at some of the technicalities in much more depth, um, uh, and then I might come back, convener. I, I was simply going to comment that obviously the MES research is intended to be representative, and it's building on that methodology of the UK MES, which takes the same approach to panels of... Um, households of these different household types and trying to come up with the goods and services that are uh, needed for those different types of households that would be representative more widely. And that's the same approach that we're proposing to take here in these specific geographic areas. Um, and I would just comment that you mentioned specifically fuel and housing costs. Um, and they are taken account of in other aspects of the definition. So at the point of comparison to the minimum income standard, these, those are not necessary to be considered as part of the minimum income standard because they are taken account in the earlier part of the definition and variations in housing type are built into the modelling that we undertake to ensure that that is taken account of across the different um, types. And, and, and I mean, obviously, the, I, I understand the Scottish Government indeed cause and a number of others are kind of less than um, supportive of our position, which I advocated myself, that um, each local authority should have a 5% target, so we would ensure there were no uh, areas where, for example, uh, there was a disproportionate uh, number of households left in fuel <coughs> poverty by 2040. But I'm just wondering if that's not going to happen with the, possi the possibility of the Scottish Government looking at a target for... Um, you know, the remote uh, rural and remote island communities and, 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 uh, of having a 5% target and the rest of Scotland's in a 5% target. You know, originally we were talking about a target for the 32 local authorities, but would the Scot given that the Scottish Government clearly understands that there's a, an issue with regard to island and remote rural communities, would there be poss possibly be a separate target set for them to ensure that regardless of all this, um, you know, mis uh, information that we, we, you know, we're able to reduce... Um, the um, fuel poverty on the islands to the same extent they are on the on, on mainland communities. Um, convener, you've <coughs> got to watch what you're saying when you say misinformation. Um, <laughs> uh, I, 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 I've talked previously about some of the difficulties uh, around about targets for each um, local authority, and I think uh, having specific targets um, for areas uh, may cause. Um, some 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 real difficulties. What I would prefer to uh, target on, and I, I don't I don't want to go into too much depth today because we are talking about um, the mis aspect, um, is um, the targeting of uh, those folks who are in extreme fuel poverty, whether they be in island or remote rural areas or urban areas. And I've already said that we will bring forward amendments uh, in that regard um, at stage two. I think it's, um, it's absolutely vital uh, that all of us uh, look to dealing with those folks who are in the greatest hardship first. Uh, and I think, you know, no matter whether they are in an island uh, or a remote area or uh, in a city, um, those are, are, are the areas that we should look to first um, in terms of, um, uh, of targeting. Um, and we will bring forward those amendments. On a separate target, I, I think then, it. I think specific. it. I think it would be extremely difficult, mm -hmm. and it throws up uh, a number of other difficulties in these regards. Um, Ailey, uh, Ms. Clarkson has done some work around about local authority um, targeting, and there are some anomalies uh, around about that. Um, I don't know how much work there has been done uh, in terms of if there was a specific island target. 
have we done? Um, I mean, we haven't specifically looked at that yet, but I think the view would generally be that such proposals should be evidence-led and subject to consultation, which it's not been so far as part of this process. And I think the other thing is in all of this, in terms of the evidence, uh, looking at some of the work um, that has gone on in, in various spheres of this, um, sometimes, you know, there are unintended consequences, there are anomalies that come into play um, if you try to, to do something uh, like that specific target. Uh, what your amendments say, Minister? Um, convener, uh, I'm sure you'll see them soon enough. Uh, Andy, do you want to come back on this? Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. And um, <clears throat> yes, I could just um, echo Graham Simpson's point. I think it's a very helpful um, uh, way of approaching matters uh, regarding these issues and this bill. Um, there is agreement now to have a separate MIS for rural and remote and islands. Um, now, as, as you, you pointed out, of course, this is just the definition, which leads to a statistic, which will be national. Um, but following on from Kenny Gibson's point, there's no reason why um, put aside separate um, targets there's no, no reason why reporting on fuel poverty can't be disaggregated to local authorities, to the rural and remote islands, class four and six, and <coughs> other urban and rural classifications, is there? Uh, no, uh, not at all. I, I, I mean, uh, we use a, a number of tools to ensure that we have information um, from various places, including um, things like the Scottish Household Survey, um, uh, to look at what is going on um, across um, uh, Scotland as a whole, but also can break that down um, into to local authority uh, level. Uh, and and uh, that could be uh, done uh, in remote rural areas and uh, island areas as well. So there's, there's no difficulty um, in reporting that. And that would be helpful, I suppose, in the sense that we've identified that rural and remote islands threw up specific challenges. <coughs> it would be helpful, therefore, to be able to report on the fuel poverty incidents in those areas, particularly. And there wouldn't be a problem in doing that, statistically. I'll, I'll, I'll take Ms Clark's, as Clark's in, who's got all of this at her fingertips in terms of the current ways of uh, gathering information and the information that we disseminate on a fairly regular basis. Um, we are certainly able under the Scottish House Condition Survey, which we use to report on fuel poverty, to break that down by the sixfold urban rural classification and separate out categories four and six um, in terms of reporting on fuel poverty rates. And that's what we did um, in this year's December publication on the current definition. And that's certainly something we can continue when the new definition comes into force as well. If it's useful um, for the committee, we can send you the links um, of the, the last set of reporting. Y yes, no, we've seen that. I just really wanted to probe that it is statistically valid to, to do that. Yeah, the yes. sample that we have for the Scottish House Condition Survey allows us to break it down to those areas of the urban rural classification. And we also, by combining three years' worth of data, are able to report on, for example, the island authorities, Shetland, Orkney, Western Isles. Um, and we do that annually, but by, but by combining the three-year sample. And, and finally, with regard to the amendment that you're proposing to bring forward on the MIS specifically, um, uh, the bill itself already makes provision that, you know, if Loughborough University ceases to exist or Mr Hirsch gets a job in Australia doing something else, um, that there are, you know, the Scottish Government will, will put in place appropriate um, ar ar arrangements. With regard to the methodology, however, is it your intention that the amendment will be prescriptive on that or would you be seeking to have some general um, uh, uh, statutory obligations which would be detailed in regulations? I think I probably need to get back to uh, um, around about that. I've been very careful today in not uh, uh, speaking about one organisation in particular, um, but I think we would have to get back to you on that in terms of uh, the, the depth of, uh, uh, of the response that is okay, required that, there. That's fine. I mean, my, my concern would be, on the one hand, we don't put something too prescriptive because, as you said, um, these things can throw up changes over the next 20 years. And on the other hand, we don't have something that's so flexible uh, that allows people to forget about the important issues that have been raised um, during the 
pass the scrutiny of this I, bill. I, I understand completely and utterly uh, where Mr Whiteman is uh, coming from. Uh, and, you know, if uh, we can do something to provide some comfort with that, then we will do so. Um, I, 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 Say I, I, I've tried not to talk about, about one particular organisation. At the same time, I, I get entirely your point. We don't want a situation where we have something in primary legislation, which is very, very difficult to change. Um, but um, you know, uh, what we should do is ensure that uh, in that primary legislation that we outline exactly uh, the very basics, is, uh, and we'll provide you with uh, some comfort in that. We'll respond to, to the committee uh, around about that. Right. Any other questions? No. Well, okay. In that case, then, uh, can I thank Mr Stewart and his officials for attending there, today's... Is anything else that I can help with in terms of information, I'm more than happy to speak to uh, members individually uh, or to provide the committee uh, with additional information as required, uh, and we'll go back and we'll uh, provide you with what we've already agreed to today. As you always are, Minister, and you'll make sure that information comes to the committee that we've requested. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the public part of today's meeting and I move the meeting into private.